<laughs> Obviously, the, the questions that we would like to ask you is, how do we make sure? Or is it too late to make sure? Ferguson, the Fed Street. Gentlemen? Well, I'll start with being. Um, my name is Jay Wendell Gordon. I'm a trial lawyer. I practice law across the state and all this in downtown Baltimore. I'm originally the lawyer lawyer. Um, what I've been doing lately is going across the state uh, talking about our cell phones. These simple devices pack a lot, a lot of technology. They're very useful when it comes to encounters with police. And not only are they useful in protecting oneself against um, the rights being violated and vindicating your rights in court, but also useful to parents who have children who drive automobiles and, and they, have, and they can uh, assist them in uh, guiding them with their encounters with police. On everybody's cell phone, they all have video cameras, these smartphones, these kids have, they have video cameras. And the video cameras are great, but one of the most, uh, I think, fascinating devices about this phone is that they all come with a voice recorder. And in Maryland, some of us get, you know, you, you know you can videotape police in the performance of their public duties. But some of us may get nervous about videotaping police. But if you have a voice recorder, and the good thing about this voice recorder is that you can put it in your pocket. And when the police officer comes up to you, to your car, you see the, in fact, I tell young people, when you see the lights on in your rear view mirror, be practice using this voice recorder and hit the record button as soon as you see the lights. So that when the police officer approaches your car, you have the beginning of the encounter through the end of it. And the beautiful thing about this voice recording device is, um, I just had it in my pocket. And... It records one. And this is good because, you know, it can't stop a police officer from pouncing on you or beating you out on the street. But when you get your lawyer and you have this recording, uh, we can use this. Uh, we can use it, we can get it transcribed into, you know, uh, we can get the transcript developed from it, or we could use it for whatever it's worth in the courtroom. We can play it, and in the case that I have on this actual phone, we will use it to impeach the credibility of the officers, and it will keep a record of the stop. So when your son says, Ma, I got stopped by police, and you ask me what happened, well, let me hit record. So you can use it as a teaching tool with your children to assist you in, in helping them get through these processes, but again, with us, I can use it before, and it's the most amazing thing, and it works wonders because you don't need a witness, and normally when you have a police encounter and, and, and a teenager, uh, nobody's listening to what the teenager has to say, and the teenager could be right, but if you got it on the recorder, oh yeah, we can do something with this. <coughs> we can do something with it in the criminal arena, and we can do something with it in the civil arena. And so don't worry about, you know, whether or not it's legal or not, Legal, it's legal, it is not a wiretap, it's not a transmission, You're recording of a police officer in the form, performance of this public duty. And even if there were any questions about that, leave it to the lawyers. That's what we do every day. We determine what's legal and what's not legal. Another thing I think would be helpful against the police, or against in protecting us against the police, is to develop some type of registry. Sex offenders have registries, gun offenders have registries, but police who engage in this conduct, they don't have a registry. Oh, and, it, and this doesn't have to come from, and this wasn't my idea, it was Eva Brown's idea, so I'm giving credit for it, Pastor Eva Brown. This doesn't necessarily have to come from the government. We can develop this through Facebook or some type of social media. And anytime something happens, it can be self report And you can put, as long as it's truthful, it's not defamation. Truth is an absolute defense to defamation. So whether or not the police officer agrees as to what happened, if, it's, if you're telling the truth as to what the police officer did, and you feel as though his name should go on this registry, put his name up there. We want to know who these police officers are. We need to keep track of these police officers who continuously violate the rights of the citizens. And we have to do it for ourselves because the government is not going to do it. 
because they're too beholden to the fraternal order of police and other unions. And it may not be politically expedient for them to do it. But this, these are things that we don't have to wait for somebody to pay for. These are things that we can do for ourselves. So I just suggest that we start doing that. But if you don't know anything else, if you didn't learn anything else from me today, tell your children about this audio recording device. Make sure they know it, have them practice it so they become fluent in it, they can pull it up even when they're nervous, they can pull it up without thinking. Have it be one of the icons on their phones so they don't even have to look for it. And this will work wonders for us. Uh, again, and also video recorder, not to diminish that. You should also video record, but again, these audio recording devices are the future. At least they have technology. They have computers in their cars. They have cameras they can scan your tag without even getting out of their car. And they can tell you whether you're a licensed driver or, or whether the car is registered, or whether the plates are expired, what have you. They can do all that. So use the technology that we have. We got technology too. And use it. It's not just the phone. This thing has the answers to everything. You got Google on this thing. This phone's got any question you have, you can probably find an answer on this phone. That audio recording device, use it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gregory Jones. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of Baltimore City. I'm a native son of the neighborhood right outside here. I grew up around Sandtown, Murphy Homes, um, Color Homes. I've seen poverty, jail, uh, drugs. So I've seen both the street side, and now I'm fortunate enough to be sitting here with the steam council. Uh, I couldn't have gotten there but by the sacrifice of the mother mother, as well as certain people. Uh, like Dr. J Dr. Elmer and Joanne Martin of Rick Lax and Wax Museum, who you heard from earlier. Uh, some of the other people, including gentlemen like Kate White Petty, who served as an example for me to look up to while I was in the street and looking up to her and trying to be something. Uh, <coughs> being able to access people like Mr. Nevin on the streets on my way to becoming a lawyer. So I say that to say, uh, at, to, to add on to what we're talking about, how we go from Ferguson and, and, and how we continue to struggle. The struggle has never stopped and continued. What we need to do first things first, we have to deal with our history and make the connection from what uh, has happened in the past to where we are today. What Mr. Pettit talked about earlier, reconstruction, a lot of the laws that came out of the reconstruction era, era and a lot of the, the things that have happened about, to our people, history is repeating itself. Some of the same actions, police action and government action, is still being implemented in the same way. We have a problem with the connect, with the disconnect of our people not explaining struggle. Our generation and the generation behind us, or I should I say this XY generation, they have a disconnect. They don't understand the struggle. They don't believe. They, they no longer see the signs that say uh, no blacks allowed or color only or whites or that kind of thing. So they don't see in, in, in the connection that the struggle that kept us uh, suppressed and, and by the oppressor is still going on. We have this belief system that A, uh, that things just happen to those people over there and not us. Then we have people in this room who, do, who practice victim blaming. And if we start dealing with the history, we understand that, that we've all been victimized and that some of us have been fortunate enough to have elected offices and so therefore we can point down our, our we can talk down our nose at those who may not uh, have jobs or, or that kind of thing. We can stand on platforms like this and we can point out and we can talk about other people who have not arrived where we are because they've not been fortunate enough to, to gain uh, access to political uh, information. But that's by and large the, the problem. We haven't connected the dots. To, now some of us, some of us in this room, the, the esteemed people that we have in this room, yeah, we, we may have uh, groups of intelligentsia in this room, but none of this intelligentsia is willing, and I dare challenge us all to take this, and let's go to Pennsylvania Avenue. Right. Let's, go up, let's go up to Pennsylvania Law Street right now, and let's have this discussion. Let's, next time, now I was a, a kid break dancing outside of here, and I, I've been on the stage at the Arena Place, so I need the Arena Place. I wouldn't be an attorney having the ability to speak to groups of people, but for the ability to be on stage but as an actor, like the other actor that you heard up here. I was up here, but it took the Arena, uh, arena Place and the history of this institution and me knowing that this place was here. But I had a mother that connected the dots and told me about this place as we walked down here. I had a mother that took me through as we walked up to the Avenue to Lafayette Market and showed me Thurgood Marshall's house in my neighborhood, so I wanted to be a lawyer instead of just being a hustler. 
So we need to connect the dots. And, and she told me about how Pennsylvania Avenue, how downtown burned, okay, when, when things went wrong, when Dr. King was killed on April 4th, 1968. See, we don't deal with the pain of the oppression. Our people don't deal with the pain of the oppression. Many of us, by and large, we drug ourselves, we drink, drink ourselves because of the things that happen to us because we have, now I study social work under Dr. Elmer Martin over at, uh, at Morgan State University, so I'm saying this from a, a certain place of study. We understand we have psychological problems that have been institutionalized. I spoke to uh, Mr. Bay earlier and I was trying to get him to, to expose us, uh, to talk about how we can implement some of these teaching that there's a psychological attack that has been happening, that has happened to us for such a long time, okay? We have not broken that, and because we've not broken that, we can't deal with some of the problems on this level with a esteemed a steam council, esteemed people like us in the same setting because we'll get across the room and we'll draw a line from black intelligentsia to the, to the proletariat to those that are on the other side of the room, those, them there niggas over there, I don't want to deal with it. I said that in words. I can't say that. I'm not, I'm not from, I'm, I represent as a member of the establishment of Office of the Court. I am a member of the establishment, but I, just as quickly as they gave it to me, I can go back to where I came from not too long ago. So, and I'll take this knowledge with me. So I say that to say, Brother Huey P. Newton and people like that taught us learning the knowledge, learning the law, which we are always a part of. We have always been in, uh, affected by it. Uh, yes, it's my business, his business, and other gentlemen up here are the business of law. This is what we do. And we need people like you to come to us for questions. But I would rather have people in my neighborhood know their rights. Know, know what the Fourth Amendment, 14th Amendment was. Know what the Fourth Amendment is. Know what your right to counsel is, your Fifth Amendment right to counsel. Okay? So I say that to say, church folk, we want to talk. Let's be real. Let's separate our love for Jesus and let's talk about what has happened to our people. Can we have a meeting where we just sit and we talk and separate and, and stop drawing lines because people don't pray the way we pray and let's deal with what has happened. Yes. Now, you all have the institutions that allow people to come and sit. Now, get with people like us so we can come and teach our people what their yes. rights are. That is not Myself included, and other gentlemen like us who have, if we could put some of our economic gain aside for a second and say, you know what, on this Saturday, I, you know what, never done myself and, and petted dogs, we're going to go down and we're going to give, uh, we're going to start a class or doing some classes on teaching this certain population about how to deal with the police. What to say when you come across an officer. Second, personal responsibility. Every time we have a black young man shot, I'm and I'm not talking about other groups of people. We can stop vilifying the victim, like we did Mike Brown. Without, without ever knowing the true facts, we let another group of people narr narrate for us and write our own narrative. Okay? And so instead of writing our own narrative, I should say. I say that to say, become more informed about the law, about the political process. We are the law. We are the criminal justice system. More than anybody else. Since slavery, we would have stopped. We take our money. If we, they don't talk about Black Out Friday when Black Friday when we decided to divest our money. They don't talk about how it affected the country. They don't talk about the stocks. They don't. They won't talk about that because we're. And if we expect them to, then we're foolish. How can you expect people or a group of people who have come out of slavery? to look back at the oppressor and hope that the oppressor will then respect us. That doesn't make sense. It is our job to learn this system. We are in a system. That's right. Don't look for these people to accept you. That's right. They don't accept us. They smile over at us with black robes and everything like that. I mean, I, there are some that are hostile. There are some that are, that are not. But this is a system. And it is, it's not about, well, you know, you get clients that come up and, and, and they believe that the, the judge should have some compassion and to do. And maybe that human being in that robe should. But don't always look at it. This is a system. So know your rights. The one of the things that made the Black Panthers so powerful is not the fact that they, they could walk down the street with their guns. It was their minds. It was the fact that these four, five young college students who sat in and listened to Malcolm X speeches were inspired by Brother Malcolm and then put into plan a plan of action. I'm not, I don't have all the answers. I don't know if Brother uh, uh, Wendell has them or Mr. Pettit or Mr. Nevinon or anybody else in this room. But I dare say if we start with our history, Telling the truth about our history. Tell it. Yeah. Yeah. Know that our laws have been created. A. Michael Higginbotham, our professor at UB, has a book called Race Law. Uh -huh. Get that book, implement it by teaching.
your own children everything in that book. It is, it is the legal precedence book. It'll tell you all the legal precedents that have been affected around race, oh, and which have brought us here similarly situated. Okay, you'll learn, you'll learn about the civil rights laws, you'll learn about the reconstruction laws that came out of that, you'll learn about the first sales of slaves and how we would then classify as property, you'll learn how everything has been codified in law. So how can we not make our children learn law? I'm not saying you have to be a lawyer. That we're, everybody's not going to be a lawyer. Okay, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. But some of us can be officers. Some of us, because that's not, that's another answer too, another part of it, because we're here for solutions. The other part is, yes, join the police department. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't want police from Dundalk and Essex and Israel and Cockeysville. I'm sorry, Cockeysville and, 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 and places like that. Join Baltimore City Police and coming, as I, if I'm riding out from Harper County and want to drop the sun off, I don't want to see guys coming in with the little blue and black bars, driving in, yeah. clean shaven faces and everything with their open glasses on, coming down to go to North Avenue or going to Central Police. Because that means that they're not in this neighborhood, they're not from this neighborhood, they're policing our neighborhood. That means you have an occupying army coming in to subject certain people to a certain type of treatment. And if you continue to have that, you don't have that connection with the people. That is our problem. I know guys who went to Warburg with me who are officers. We don't see enough of that. And so you have this disrespect uh, and this, this no relationship with the people from the community. And therein lies our problem. So I'm sorry, I you know we have a uh, other state council. Please forgive me, I've been a little wrong with you. <laughs> So at the end of the day, no one can say, I didn't have an opportunity. 
I can take you to the water, but I can't make you drink. That's right. And so the third thing is accountability for ourselves and our family. We have failed our children miserably. We have used schools as daycares. We use schools as daycares. We don't follow up behind them with the education that they give. And then you wonder why a gang member can easily recruit them. Because that foot upside their head, that hand upside their hind pots, is really all they're asking for. I just need to know that you love and care. Because guess what? The blood, the crypt set, they don't got to know they care. They won't welcome them in. Two-parent families mean nothing. We saw that in Columbine. Well-to-do affluent, white Americans, kids going through whatever, because we disconnected and disassociated ourselves from our children. That's part of the problem that we're dealing with. And we've got to call a spade a spade when it comes to home. Now, when I came up, home stayed at home. You didn't take your business outside the house, but you dealt with it. And my parents or my grandparents were the first to say, not, oh, not my baby, like, I'll deal with it. Because they knew. They knew what our strengths were. They knew what our weaknesses were. But we have got to really begin to have serious conversation if we're going to do that. Because the bottom line is this. We have to start also being very real about terminology, use of words. Huh? Come on, man. Thank you for you all getting all hyped up on police engagement and community engagement. Well, guess what? Uncle Sam told me in the military as a military police officer, engagement means to come back, to confront. That means I'm prepared to deal with whatever it is that comes in front of me. How about we stop getting with the flowery words of community policing, because policing is also a military term for cleaning up. How about we start saying community partnering? How about we make our law enforcement partner with us? Because the philosophy that they're taught is 70% of your work is working with your community <laughs> to do the work for you. The other 30% represents you actually having to enforce the laws. Community partners. So we got to be careful of the words that we use and what we throw around so loosely. Because they do have meaning. That's right. So these are the kind of conversations that we have to have. From a strategy standpoint, we got to attack the use of force. No question about it. We have to attack the use of force. Number two, we have to make sure that we protect our children to survive the encounter. And we got to get some of these raggedy, ragtag elected officials that have been holding up dead space and wait. Come on now. We can't do that. We can't do that. We are not advocating for your community. You don't need to hold up this space. That's the way it is. If we want to begin to see change, then we've got to make sure we're not just starting from the top down, from the bottom up. Because it's us, our votes, that make the difference. Yeah. Your vote has value. So don't cry when you, look, let me put it this way. And I, like I say to the men now, for the brothers, for the young guys, they will go out and spend two to $300 on a pair of Jordans. Yeah. Right? If there is a flaw, one flaw on them tennis shoes, he's going back to the store and returning them and saying, this is unacceptable for our sisters with these Louboutins, these red bottoms. You get one nick on that heel, you're taking them back. But you get a sorry piece of representation and you say nothing. Spend your money wisely. You get what you pay for. That's what we got to do. So my solution is, right now, to help with all the think tanks, we need some sure enough strong leaders. And develop them into the next generation of leadership and our city council, our mayor, and the rest, and let's clean house. And take our house back.
and know his direction. And when I say that, I think about Emmett Till, how to ignite the nation. I think about Rodney King, that ignited the nation. I think about what we saw in New York, Mr. Gardner, that has the opportunity to ignite a nation. I see what happened in Ferguson, the young Michael, which has the opportunity to ignite a nation. And the reason I point those examples out, because my distinguished brother here when, has just indicated that technology has become of age, and that's good and bad. One thing about those phones that they can track us everywhere with them also. That's right. But the good part about it that we are now seeing, like we did with technology, when they had an open casket with young Emma Till sitting in that casket, beat to a bloody pulp. The nation saw that. We saw the civil rights movement on the cameras and TV. A nation saw that. And now, through the technology of today, and telephones and video, and the ability to capture what happened, we are seeing for the first time the police brutality in this nation. In Baltimore City, if they had seen what happened to Tyler West, yes, they would have the same response that we have nationally. Right. <laughs> so the from the cases that I'm working on that happen every day, we'd have had the response that this nation is now having 10 years ago. And so now this nation is having a response. And when I talked earlier about 2016, we have to say that these young men did not die in vain. Right. And what does that mean? That we have to use this as a jump off point, as a galvanizing point, that, that what happened yesterday will not be forgotten. That these hundreds of thousands of people that are walking in America now, hand in hand and laying down in driveways and thoroughfares and highways, will have to carry this into the political results in the political mandate of 2016. We have an opportunity to build off the tragedy that has happened to us and we cannot waste it. That's right. That's right. Thank you. I just want to say one thing very quickly and that Brother Bay actually made a, the most probably profound effect point when we talk about penal institutions. Yes. And that is this. If you think about a prison, look at the number of inmates that occupy it, and look at the number of guards that control it. Think of us as a people. Think of the number of us that represent the citizenry of Baltimore City and the minority number of those that control it. The fear is, if they ever get organized,